Okay, so we're going to get right into God's word this morning. Um, the other day, I had just landed in New York, and I was going to speak for the United Nations. And um, the flight, you know, was a long flight. It was like 14 hours direct to get to, to New York. And then I was barely going to have like three um, hours from when I landed to when the um, meeting was to start. And there were these very top people, representatives of different countries that were going to be at the meeting. So I wanted to be as fresh as I could be. And so my luggage was a little delayed before we got the luggage out. And so I was really tracking the time, you know, from when I was picked up to um, getting to the hotel, trying to freshen up. I was hoping to catch a nap, um, but you know, it was, you can't be late. Those guys keep to time kind of a thing. Anyway, so um, event was to start 7 p.m. 7 p.m. is 7 p.m. You better just be there and all of that. So while we were on the drive to the hotel, I was trying to just get my thoughts together. You know, there was a drop line where I was really hoping to climax. And you know, some people using translations and all of that. I was hoping that it would sit well. Um, but it, my drop line, there was that part of my talk. And I only had like five minutes to talk, so I needed it to be very sharp. Um, that the young people of the world are at the mercy of the mercy less, trusting the power of the powerless, and obviously growing into less and less. But there's a way I was trying to get that emotion and get it set. So I was trying to like rehearse it on my way to the hotel and all of that. Anyway, when I got to the hotel, my biggest fear was going to oversleep, you know, because <laughs> if I go and sleep after coming all the way and all of that. This was my first time speaking for the United Nations and all of that. Um, then I woke up. <laughs> I woke up. Okay, let me, let me ask you guys. Have you ever had one of those dreams that when you woke up, you're like, no, we're going back home. <laughs> we're going back home. Uh, <laughs> like we are going back. This dream, in fact, we prefer the dream to what's going on. Then you wake up and um, maybe it's like one mosquito that first woke you up, that bro, come back to reality here. You are sweating and all of that. Whatever was going on in the dream, you are loving it. Everything was so good there and all of that. But here you are back to reality. It was so good there. Sometimes the experience you are having in the dream was so fulfilling, so exciting, like you are smiling you are loving it. You are doing whatever you are there to do till you came back to what now is reality. Sometimes for the first one or two minutes when I wake up, I'm like, how am I sure this new one is not the dream? I think that one might be the, maybe the real life, but sooner or later you realize. Maybe you really love what was going on in the dream. Maybe you even preferred the person you are married to in that dream. To her dad. The person was sure no stress. <laughs> or maybe the person you are dating or whatever in that dream. You just loved it. Or, or the food you are eating in that dream was so good. Somebody's like, that is spiritual attack. Hey, it's a lie. You are enjoying the food like it was so good and all of that. But you came back um, here to reality and all of that. Um, but maybe as we continue our work conversation today and even round it off um, this morning, I wonder whether you can relate to this idea of kind of having a dream on one end. Like there's that sense of this is the dream. This is what I would long for. This is what's on my heart. This is what would really be my dream. But there's the sense of this is my reality on the other end. Maybe you really know that feeling of the difficulty between what is my dream and where I am. Because there are two pain points that we find when you just feel woken up from a dream. There are two pain points. The first is about being so far away from a dream. You know, in a moment, just two minutes ago, you felt like you were in New York, like you were really there. But now you feel so far away from it. And then secondly, it's feeling so helpless or that overwhelming sense of difficulty of trying to make that dream come true. So it's like there's a dream, but it feels so difficult to make it come true. And maybe as we're having this work conversation this morning, you feel those pain points. You feel that sense of there are things that are really on my heart. There are dreams that I started out with 10 years ago, but I know the pain points of like the overwhelming sense of difficulty to make it happen and all of that. Maybe you feel far away from the dreams that you have um, for yourself or you had in your career. Maybe as a young child, your dream was to be a doctor, to be in this life-saving mission of just bringing life to the dead. We wake up in the morning and just be operating and helping people and making them alive. Like, I just want to be a doctor. Then Jam just woke you up like, hello, hello, you know, <laughs> uh, you're about science. You know, stuff, stuff like that, right? Whatever, 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 you know, wherever, wherever I landed you, all right? Or maybe your dreams of like, ah, when we were gaining admission, you were so excited, I'm going to finish school at 19 and then by 2019, be one of the 19 top people in my field in the world. No, look, that asshole just came and said, come, yeah, take two, <laughs> take, take three and stuff like that. Maybe stuff I'm just like woken, giving me that sharp reality of, ah, the dream, it just feels far um, away. Or maybe your dream of a quality business um, that you wanted to run and 
and just the level at which you wanted to do it. It's really being hit by economic instability and things like that. You know, there's this thing when my, my kids are waking up, um, and I always like it. You know, sometimes you have seen them, they're even smiling in the dream. Yeah, yeah. Then you wake them up. They're in that tussle of coming to reality or staying in the dream. So they're like, mm, struggling with They wake up, you know, and stuff like that. So, so you maybe in that fight of no, the dream, but then you just feel like you've been shocked out of it. Um, maybe your dreams of what you wanted to do with your marriage or, you know, relationship, dreams of career growth, or even just the regular things you put effort towards. Um, you started out the year with a dream of losing weight, that this year I'm going to drop 25 kg. Right now, yeah, just 35 kg to go, you know, and you started out, the, sorry, you didn't get that. You started out the year, we're going to drop weight this year, perfect shape, perfect size, yes, girl, dance route, oh, let's go there, woo, and all of that. And then just after one day in the gym, you just came back, right? you sat down that woo, um, this, when rapture happens, is there a maximum weight for people that will fly? Is there a maximum weight? Like, you know, weight loss in the morning, you know, stuff like that, okay? Um, whatever it is, just that sense of difficulty on the journey of dreams many times makes it feel so distant um, from us. And maybe this morning you're asking questions like, is my effort even ever really going to count? Um, as I do my work, as I build stuff, will my effort count? Will it count in the long run? Will my dreams ever come true? Um, will my hopes just be cut short? Will my expectations ever be fulfilled? Um, let me ask it this way. Will I ever move to a place of real significance? Will I move from a life of surviving, keeping my head above the water, to a place of real significance? Will I move from paying bills and just trying to survive to a place of purpose and of greater essence in my life? Um, because the reality is there are all these things that are against us, that it feels like it's waking us up out of a place of dreams and it, there's distractions on one end, but there's also opposition. There is sometimes just difficult systems. There is pain and all of that. It feels like it's waking you out and saying, come out of your dreams and come to what we would call reality here. But today, what I want to speak to you on for week two of this is how to build great things against all odds. How to build great things against all all odds. Because friends, I believe with all my heart that by the help of God, we can do big things with the work of our hands, what I call against all odds kind of things, what I call legacy kind of things, for the glory of God, for the good of people. I believe with all my heart that we are called to do it and we can do it. We're going to build great things against all odds, all right? Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10, the Bible says, for we are his handiwork, all right, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. This is why God made us, that God's work was to make us the kind of people that can do good work, all right? And we will do this kind of good work because this is what God makes us to be. He says that God prepared it in advance that we would walk in it, all right? Now, again, if you haven't gotten a recap of what we've done in this work series, I recommend it for you from last year. We did different messages. Um, last year, I did why work should really be fun, how to do good work in bad and toxic places. And then we also did how to bring the God advantage into your work. Last week, we did um, how to make your work work. And I would again recommend for a listen that all of that would be helpful. You can scan the QR code on the seat in front of you and get a direct link to it. Or wherever you get Sikama messages, you can get all those titles and they will be absolutely helpful. I won't go over a lot of what I have previously said. But let's get into this conversation and this is where I'm going to round off um, for our work series today. There's a guy called Nehemiah in the Bible. And today I'm going to walk you, as we talk about how to do great work against odds, I'm going to walk you through quite a lot of his story. All right. So if you have a Bible, you can open anywhere in the book of Nehemiah. I'll probably meet you there. We meet this guy working a job as a cupbearer for a king, okay? And so he's, whether you call it his nine to five or his day job is that he kind of pours out the king's drinks and, you know, he's in charge of not just serving the king, but he has to like taste it first because the king must be safe. So, you know, if they're, it's a risky job because if they want to poison the king, then they will observe him first. He will die and the king will not drink itself like that. So he has to taste it. He has to make sure everything is right and all of that. So, He'll first finish one, then give the king the next one, okay? But, but the idea anyway is that he's basically working this job. And he's actually a slave, right? He's, um, he's, he's on exile. He's, he's, he's exiled from his homeland. So he's like a slave working this job. And of course, a very high-level slave, but trusted to be this king's cupbearer. But this is his job. And as we travel down the journey, just a little while later, we're eventually going to meet Nehemiah building the wall of Jerusalem, all right? And so it's almost like while he was doing this, there was kind of this that was always in him. There was kind of like we could not just build walls, but bring a reformation to Jerusalem, lead people at a high level. But here's what I have in my hands to do now. And so in my hands right now is I'm just showing up to do this thing of serving the king. I'm actually an exiled slave and all of that, but serving the king. And this is what I'm showing up to every day. But if you ask me, this is my 
here, but there's kind of a there in my heart. There's kind of a what God can do through my life. There's kind of a possibilities of building walls, of seeing generations impacted. I feel like I'm more gifted, I'm more skilled, and all of that. If I would ask you today, what is your here? And what could be your there, right? What is your here in terms of, this is what is in my hands to do. But what is your there? And many times this is, man, there are things in my heart that I would love to do, all right? Um, but what is your here? Which is that I'm trying to pay my bills and meet today. But I have a there of dreams, of purpose, and of significance, and all of that. You're here, and you're there. You're here, and you're there. So Nehemiah has a here where we meet him. But we're going to find that in a moment we would see him at the place of he's there. The journey from being a cup bearer to being a wall builder. The journey from um, what's in my hand to what's in my heart. The journey from the need for survival to a place of purpose. And I'm saying that we can do great work against all odds, friends. The journey from putting out effort. And all I feel like I'm doing is I'm taming children. Uh, but, but my dear feels like, you know, that beautiful place where I'll walk my daughter down the aisle and give her to her husband that I chose for her. And, you know, just be in that joyous moment. But but right now, your hair is that I'm literally taming. Do you know what I'm trying to say, right? Your hair to your there. And it feels like a very difficult, in fact, I would suggest a very long journey from here to there. Because what we find about Nehemiah is that he's exiled in a, in a Persian place called Susa, which is in modern day Iran. And it's going to be a journey of 800 miles to come to Jerusalem, which they would estimate took him probably about four months to travel and then another 52 days to, to build the wall. All right? And so many times we think of the here and there. And while you're here, because it's in your heart, you kind of feel like it's just there, but sometimes it feels like a dream that is so far away. It's a difficult 800 miles. If you get what I'm trying to say, it's a difficult process many times. Like, I want to be there, but all I have now is my hair. Let me ask somebody next to you, what's your hair? What's your there? Well, Nehemiah, he had to risk his life and, you know, leave his job here and risk his life and um, go on that difficult journey and spend what he had and, you know, do all of that um, and use even his personal resources to go and build the wall of Jerusalem. But here's where I'm going. There are a few things we're going to learn from Nehemiah that I believe would apply even to the work of our own hands, how we can be tracking from here to there. Because there's great work that we can build against all odds. We can see that sense of building walls and completing things and doing great things and our lives counting, our efforts counting and all of that. But there are a few things that we can highlight from Nehemiah for ourselves today, okay? Because friends, I want to remind you, every single one of us, I believe with all my heart that you can build great things against all odds. I believe that by the help of God, you can build great against all odds, legacy kind of things with the effort in your life. For the glory of God, for the good of people, all right, and so first of all, between our here and our there, we are going to need to understand our seasons. We're going to need to understand our seasons from our here to our there because here is a season of your life, and there is a season of your life serving the, the king and pouring, you know, drinks. And serving him, it's a season of your life, Nehemiah. And there again is another season, and, and your seasons are different. So what are we going to do? We need to understand our seasons. Everybody say that word, seasons. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 1 says, To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. I would suggest to you that even in the work of your hands, there are seasons, that there are work seasons, and we must understand that so that we will be making wise decisions. Being here is a different season from being there. At some point, he's serving the king. At another point, he's building walls. He's leading a front lines of building. It's important that we are sensitive to how God is leading us in our seasons and how it plays out with our work and all the decisions that need to flow through from that. 1 Chronicles 12 verse 32, you probably know it, of the sons of Issachar who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. It's by understanding the times that we can know what we should do. Let me suggest it to you this way. When you're in your 20-somethings, it's different from when you're in your 30-something or your 40-something. It's different. And I don't think you should be thinking in the same way about both seasons of your life. For example, there are seasons of your life, of your work life, where you have more risk capacity. And you must see it. There are seasons where there are a lot of family dynamics to, na to navigate through, and it influences how you think of the decisions to make in that season. In other words, how do I interpret being here and traveling there? I must understand what season I am. Some of the big questions we are able to ask ourselves about work, I would always say, it's not just what am I doing or how am I doing. It's also when am I? 
when am I? I know it doesn't sound good, but when am I? What season am I? What can I say about the timing and the space season of my life? When am I? Because that will teach me there are seasons in your life where you are better positioned to create margin than other seasons, all right? What do I mean by creating margin? Some of you, at a young age, you maybe start earning a little more. It doesn't translate to the fact that the level of your life should go and start being lived at that level. Sometimes it's just an opportunity for you to create margin. Are you hearing me this morning? There are other seasons in your life whereby the dynamics maybe of family and things like that, you are not as for It's a season of your life. Now, don't let any season overwhelm you and all of that. Embrace it for what it is, but make best decisions based on the season where you are. Don't just ask what's happening. Be asking, when am I? Sometimes you're in a season to endure. Don't just rush off that job. Sometimes you're in a season to navigate. Sometimes to, to, to move, all right? Sometimes when I don't like my job, but I endure for the sake of a passage to something more, right? Sometimes there's a season where I don't like what I'm doing, but I would endure and see it through for the sake of something else. It's all season. The big word is seasons. Okay, now second big word from where we meet Nehemiah here, and this is what he's doing, but that's where he's going to get to. This is what is in hands, but that's what's in his heart, and he's going to get there. Second big word that we must highlight for ourselves is the importance of keeping the right balances, Keeping the right balances. The big word is balance, or if you prefer the word rhythm. This is the idea. There's always going to be like two sides of, kind of like two ends of a stick. And we must be able to keep both of them in the merit of what they are. A lot of our work life is going to be those two ends. And it's like a cyclist who knows the beauty of gliding from side to side. Side to to side, sustaining a journey by understanding the importance of keeping the right balances. What we see in scripture is a lot that would invite us to keep the right balances. One, one Corinthians chapter one says that Christ is made to us wisdom and power from God as an example. So there is the wisdom revelation of Christ to us. There's the power revelation and understanding where it works and how to run that rhythm of balance of, he can't just all be wisdom to us. There, there's places that have to be power. Do you get what I'm saying? He can't just all be power. There are places where you make a wise choice, all right? But it's understanding the wisdom of balance between all of this. Let me show you what I'm saying with Nehemiah. In Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 16, um, you know that there was opposition that was coming against them and all of that, Sambalat and Tobiah and all those guys. And so when we read from verse 16, look at Nehemiah's response. So it was from that time on that half of my servants work at construction, while the other half held the spears, the shields, the bows, and war armor, and the leaders were behind all the house of Judah. Those who build on the wall and those who carried burdens loaded themselves so that with one hand they worked at construction. And with the other hand, they held a weapon to fight. Every one of the builders had his sword. He was building, but he had his sword guarded at his side as he built. And the one who sounded the trumpet was beside me. So what do we see with Nehemiah? We see that he's keeping the balance between building and battling because there's opposition. We can't just say, oh, all we are here for is to build the wall and the opposition is coming and it takes us down, all right? There are fires that sometimes you need to fight, but we can't then just make ourselves warriors and say, all we are doing is fighting a war. There's a wall that we want to build. So what do we see? The beauty and the importance of understanding balance, of building and of battling. And what we see with Nehemiah, it says, hold in one hand an equipment to build, in one hand something to fight and they're keeping that balance. People are working at constantly Construction. People are working at warfare. It's keeping the balance between battling and building. Here's what I'm saying. Sometimes your Monday to Friday may look like battling and battling and putting out fires and all of that. But you have to understand the beauty of balance. You can't make your whole life about putting out fires. Do you understand? There has to be a space in your life for vision and things like that. But at the same time, you won't be able to come and say, oh, because of the visions in my heart. But there are fires that are burning your house down. You would need to address. So what does that land us on? The importance of balance. Let me tell you what it might look like in your own context. Because you don't just want to build and forget to battle but you also don't want to battle and lose sight of what you're building for some of you it might look like the balance between a drive of vision and I desire more and balancing that with a contented and rested heart it's a balance isn't it for some of you it might be your search for fulfillment versus a sense of what I'm earning my earning capacity for some of you it might be a balance between work commitments and family time how many guys know that thing of your wife comparing you, your job with her? You know that thing, like, you know, you have spent three hours at work. How long have you spent with your wife? I think they're like, right, yeah, you have no right. You get what I'm trying to say, all right? And it's, it's a balance you're looking for between work commitment, family time, um, pursuing growth, and increasing earning versus, is this a season of learning? Balance between being a tough employee 
that knows what it is to stand up for my rights. I won't allow an organization to I'll stand up, I'll speak up, I'll do all of that. I won't be that tough employee versus becoming a vulnerable person that will be exploited in, you know, I'm keeping a good heart. It's balance. It's balance. Or let, let me even help you, maybe you're an employer of labor. The balance between, I really want to take care of my employees. I, you know, I want this to be the best workplace anywhere. I want people to feel free. Let's have a first name policy. Let's you know, just be able to talk, speak up. Let's hear people, you know, that kind of environment. Like we encourage it and all of that. Versus people then taking it as indulgence. You get what I'm trying to say? So because we say, let's be free, you know, then I say, hey, you, okay, come. You, you, uh, you get what I'm trying to say? All right, so, so where do we draw the lines? Um, and this is what I'm suggesting to you, that what we will see about balance what we must learn about balance, this is my key for you, is to see the merit of both sides and be present enough to read the moment. I'll say that again. This is how balance works. You must be able to see the merit of both sides. Should I love my, my staff? Of course I should. You know, there's a merit in that, okay? Should there be discipline in my organization? Of course there should. There's a merit in that. So I must see the merit on both sides, but be present enough to read the moment. So here's what balance will look like. I'll suggest balance is not always 50-50. It's not always a 50-50 distribution. It's more about right time, right thing. Say that again. Balance will be more about right time, right thing. I can't say I'm sharing my time between my family and my work, 50-50. No, it's about right time, right thing. When you understand right time, right thing, that would mean that there are some family things that you will show up for no matter what. You will tick those boxes. You will be present. You will show up. Do you understand? You will fight to say, right time. This right thing will tick that box. Now, by ticking that box, sometimes you are released. So it will be 100-0 that day. There will be other times it will now be 0-100. Do you get what I'm trying to say? But it can't always be 50-50. Nobody gets. That's why we call it rhythm. It's right time, right thing. Balance will look like right time, right thing. Okay? And what we see with Nehemiah is the wisdom of saying, we won't just start battling and forget to build. We won't just start building and forget to battle. We would see right time, right thing. But let me remind everybody today who is in that fight of trying to say, I want to keep the right balance, be, you know, keep things right. And it feels like there's a lot on my hands. I want to encourage you and remind you, God will not put on you more than what he, can, he knows you can handle. Everything that God expects of you, he supplies it to you by his grace, all right? So there might be wisdom questions, there might be interpretation questions, but let me encourage you today. God will not call you for something he will not equip you for. The life that God expects for you, you have everything it takes to be everything God calls you to be. Who says amen to that today? All right, let's do a third one this morning. From here to there, how are we going to move from our here to there and build great things against all odds? We will understand the potential of problems to birth vision. Problems have a potential to birth vision. It all started for Neymar as just a regular guy minding his own business, doing his nine to five, just here. Then he heard news of a problem. And that problem came with the capacity to birth, to unsettle him. To the point that he started to travel and dream like there's more in me, right? What triggered it? It was not a promotion of work that triggered it. It was bad news. It was a problem that triggered that. Hey, friends, problem has the potential to birth. And we need vision because the Bible says without vision, people cast off all restraint. We wonder about, we're not doing anything meaningful if there isn't a sense of vision in our lives. And what birth vision for Nehemiah? It was a sense of what's the problem around? What's the problem I'm hearing? But this is what I would suggest to you today. If we hear problems at a neutral level, just at a flat level, it will overwhelm us. It will get us down and knocked out. Give me Nehemiah chapter one, verse four. It will get us knocked out. We'll just be down. We will just be, you know, burdened and all of that. The Bible says, so it was when I heard these words that I sat down. The bad news, I sat down and I wept and I mourned. That's what you're going to do. The problems are so bad. The system is bad and all of that. That's why the Bible would say, guard your heart with all diligence. You must know how to do that. There must be a sense of, I'm not just exposing my heart in the wrong ways to just be, you know, this attraction for all the problems and all of that. I must be able to guard my heart. So this is how I guard my heart. The Bible says that when Nehemiah sat down and wept and mourned for many days, I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Here's what he did. He took a problem and gave it a God response. When we don't just take it at the level of what's the problem, but we respond towards God. That I start, then God can reconstruct it into a language of vision for us. That what looked like broken down walls became an invitation to go and build, all right? God can start to speak calling into our lives that potential and gifting and anointing upon our lives. When we respond from, this is just a problem, but there is a God response that I hold towards, all right? So guys, we're going to guard our hearts. There's a lot of problems around, and I'm not saying become a negative 
negative, cynical person because of all the problems and all of that. But I'm saying take those problems, all right? Don't be absent from me, but make sure you hold a God response. Guard your heart with all diligence because that's what your life will look like. But when I'm hearing problems, they have the potential to birth a God response, to birth a response of vision. And we need God to be shaping vision in our lives. We must have that healthy response um, to problems. Next thing I'm going to suggest to you that moves Nehemiah from here to there is that simply starting out from here, there's a lot to figure out and then there's a long journey. And so what does he need? He needs the power of staying through, the power of staying through, that we start out from here and, and there's a journey I'm going to travel. It's 800 miles to get to the place where we are building the walls and there's all that opposition and difficulty and negativity and people laughing at us. But you know what we need if we're going to do great things? We need the power of staying through. I'm so glad that the scripture says we are not of them that draw back to perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of. So there's going to be something in us that believes that we can stay through, that we can see seasons through. Season out, season in, we're going to be faithfully doing what God calls us to do. There's going to be that sense of a builder that is in us, that we would stay through. Let me give you an example. In Nehemiah 2 verse 19, some of the opposition that was coming, if we're going to defy odds and build great things, Nehemiah 2 verse 19, when Sambalat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite, and Gershom the Arab heard of it, they laughed at us. And they despised us and said, what is this thing that you are doing? Will you rebel against the king? So I answered them and I said to them, I said, the God of heaven himself will prosper us. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build. But you have no heritage or right or memorial in Jerusalem. I love verse 20, and I feel like we can all say that together. Um, everybody, let's go. One, two, three, go. I answered them and said to them, the God of heaven himself will prosper us. Now, let's, let's personalize it this morning. Say, the God of heaven will prosper me. Therefore, I, his servant, will arise and build. Let's do that one more time. The God of heaven himself will prosper me. Therefore, I, his servant, will arise and build. We're going to stay through. We're not going to allow this what they said. What's some people are laughing at what some people that then we now back out and say yeah, let's just go back no there's going to be something in us that is defiant that will stay through that will draw encouragement in the face of discouragement 1 Samuel 30 verse 6 David was distressed it was all bad for him greatly distressed not just distressed his people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all his people his team was down people were grieved everything was bad every man for his son and his daughters but David strengthened himself in the Lord his God friends you're going to know this on your work journey there are going to be seasons of taking one more step and all you need to be able to do is to strengthen yourself in the Lord your God. We are not of them that draw back to perdition. Friends, at some point, if you quit because of opposition, listen, if you quit because of opposition at some point, it means you didn't really believe in the vision. There's got to be something in you that believes in what God has put in my heart. Proverbs chapter 24 verse 10, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. It doesn't say the adversity is great. No, it says your strength is small. If you faint, it's not because of the greatness of the opposition. It is down to the, smell, the smallness of your strength. So there's got to be something in us. I'll say we will go through. We will stay through. We believe that God has prospered us. We will arise and we'll build. Who says amen to it this morning? We'll arise and we'll build. The God of heaven has prospered us. Two people clap. You don't clap. I don't know why. What's wrong with you? Are you not listening? The God of heaven has prospered us. And so maybe you're asking this morning, how? It's difficult. My Monday morning, last week I was speaking to you about how you don't just work or work diligently or work for God, but you also learn to work with God. I'll tell you one way you can draw encouragement is by working with God. Let me encourage everybody. Learn what it means to practice the presence of God with your work. What does that mean? Build a consciousness of God's presence with you when you show up to work. You don't pray in the morning and then go into the day and forget about. Give yourself reminders of the presence of God. This was something Brother Lawrence taught the church from like, the 11th century or whatever, about practicing. He was an illiterate, uneducated in the monastery, but he learned what it means to say, I'm cooking, and then I start thinking, oh, the God of the pans and the pots and the spoons and the God who orchestrated creation and all of that. I start building a consciousness of God in the space of my work. Listen, friends, God is with you. He wants you to know his presence and we'll be discouraged. Satan will disarm us of our courage. You don't mean of discouraged, to discourage, to remove courage. We'll be weak, discouraged people if we're not practicing the presence of God and drawing strength and encouragement and inspiration and staying through in the course of what God has called us to do. So I would encourage you today, know what it means to say, I'm practicing the presence of God. I'm building a consciousness of God's presence with me. It's the place of my work, of my business, of my relationships, of all that I'm putting effort to. God is with me. I'm not alone. God is with me. Let that give you strength and encouragement. The problem many times is that we're more conscious of the people around than we are of the God who is with us. We're more conscious of the opposition around. Sambalat and Tobiah look 
looks so big and God looks so small. Do you get what I'm trying to say here? The problems of what your boss said look so big and God becomes so small. Let's practice the presence of God. Let's know that God is with us. God is not sending us an assignment that he's leaving us out. You know, when God calls us to, we're called people. We're on assignment for God. We're doing our work for the glory of God, for the good of people, expressing God's heart in his created world. We're bringing creativity, bringing skill, bringing effort, bringing wisdom, bringing faithfulness, and seeing God bless the work of our hands to do great things for the glory of his name and for the good of his people. Who says amen to that? All right, I'll say two more things before I close. Number, uh, whatever number you're on. Um, now, maybe you'd say, but you don't understand. The, the systems are bad. Things are dead, difficult and all of that. I, 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 what can we do about the economy when we're trying to build business? Here's what Neymar will tell you. As Neymar is here and he has that wall to build and we can't predict all the factors. There are places he's going to travel through where there's going to be difficult terrains and opposition and all of that. But here's what Neymar will tell you. Control what you can. Control what you can. I'm not here to tell you that you have control of every factor, of every system, but here's what I'm here to encourage you. Control what you can. What's in your hands to control? What's within the reach of your control? Control what you can. You can control the spirit that you keep about work. You can control your effort and your diligence. You can control. You may not be able to control the economy, but you can control your faithfulness. You may not be able to control people's response, but you can control. You may not be able to control what people will do to you, but you can control how you respond to it. Are you hearing me this morning? morning. You, are you hearing me this morning? Control what you can. Control what you can. I want to encourage somebody today. Control what you can. Control. Uh, build a good spirit about your work. Build a good commitment to do good work. You may not be able to control what happens to you, but you can control your response. You can't control the economy, but you can control your work ethic. Control what you can. Fight to keep a good spirit about your work. A good attitude. Fight to be that person overflowing with a sense of life that God is with you. Let your gratitude overflow. Keep a good spirit about yourself. Control what you can. The things that are not in your control. But listen, listen, listen what I've learned. When you control the things, when you face the things that are in your control, there's a grace that sets in for the things that are not in your control. I'll say that again. When you face the things that are in your control, there's a grace that sets in for the things that are not in your control. Train up a child in the way he should go. That's what you can do. I can train him up. I can't control his future. I can train him up. But when he's old, he will not depart from it. There's a grace that will be at work when I can't be there. Are you hearing me? this morning. Control what you can. Control what you can. Put a good spirit about your work. Keep a good attitude about what you do. Control what you can and let God take care of what you can't control. But don't sit down here mourning about how bad people are on the journey. Well, you control what you can. You work hard. You do what you can do. You be a faithful person in the system. You control what you can, all right? And allow God to do for you what you can't do for yourself. You can keep a good spirit with your work. You can stay inspired. You can be full of hope. Listen, when we lose a sense of hope and of inspiration, what we don't realize is that the devil is disconnecting us from the future. One of the things God gives to us that connects us to the future is hope. Hope, the Bible says, when it is appeared, when hope has appeared, the Bible says it's no longer hope. In other words, hope is a promise of more, not of here. All right, Prom hope is a to come, all right? And so every time God puts a voice of hope in your heart, it's an invitation to a future that is more than here and now. Are you hearing me this morning? And so when you become a hopeless person, when, when the devil takes away hope from your heart, what he's doing is he's disconnecting you. He's making you live in the now and disconnecting you from the future. But come on, friends, we are a people of hope. Because of Jesus, we are a people of hope. Come on. There's a voice of hope and of inspiration that we can stay faithful on. It's not about the system. It's about who Jesus is. We have an anchor for our souls. It's a hope that Jesus gives to us. You can stand on that. Control your spirit. Maybe a system isn't treating you right. But here's what you should know. The Bible says that you would reap whatever you sow. Not wherever you sow. Sometimes the system doesn't even deserve you. But you can control what you sow. And God is faithful to reward you, to honor you in his own way. But don't become responsive and living at that low level. Are you hearing me this morning? Control what you can. Look at somebody this morning and say, control what you can. Control, control what you can. All right, as I, as I close this morning, I think that what we would then see is that Nehemiah moves from Oh King, you can drink. <laughs> it's good. What, what we're eventually going to see is that we would then meet Nehemiah and all his men building a wall, raising it up, and we're seeing it going up and going up, and going up, and becoming more. And we'll be like, wow, Nehemiah, you're building a wall. You have all the strength to build a wall, and all the laborers are carrying and all of that. But here's what I would suggest to you. I think it came out as a wall, but he was simply focused on building other things. 
I'll tell you what I'm saying this morning. Because as I track through the story of Nehemiah, and as you are asking yourself, yes, I want to build great things, and I want to see destiny and, you know, legacy and things that will stand the test of time. What I would suggest to you this morning is that Nehemiah was simply building other things, but it came out as a wall. For example, I see that Nehemiah was simply putting one more block of credibility every day of his work, credibility. He was working before the king and as we start to read the narrative, he was just a faithful man. Let me show you the wordings in Nehemiah chapter 2. Give me Nehemiah chapter 2 and you know the verse, just help me put it up. Um, Nehemiah chapter 2. Nehemiah, yeah, thank you. And the Bible says that he came to pass, Nehemiah 2 verse 1, he came to pass in the month of Nisan and after the year of Toyota in the 20th, <laughs> in the 20th year of the king that when Nehemiah brought wine before the king, right? He just did some mix for the king, all right? And the Bible says when he brought it before the king and he gave it to the king, right? It's good. Now, the Bible says, now I had never been sad in his presence before. Now, look at the next verse. Therefore, the king said to me, wait, hold the drink. Why is your face sad? Since you are not sick, this is nothing but sorrow of heart. So Nehemiah even says, I became dreadfully afraid. I'll, I'll, but, but do you know what's happening here? Nehemiah is showing up on this day, and he's doing his work at a lower level because he's sad this day. But the Bible says the king noticed, I had never been sad before the king before. It was a cause of alarm that Nehemiah is sad. Ah, he had built credibility. You know, for some of you, it's the day you are happy that they will ask you why. Uh, no, you didn't hear what I just said. You didn't hear what I just said, though. That, what happened to you that you're happy today? Do you get what I'm trying to say? I had never been sad. Check my track record. I show up with a good spirit to my work. I build a credibility about my work. The king knows. I can be trusted. I can be counted on. I can be relied on. Let me ask you this morning, in the space of your work, what can we take for granted? That you are building credibility, but it's coming out as a wall for generations. That's what I want you to see. That what we will focus on is to build credibility. Do your work well. Do your work well. Build credit. It's layer upon layer. Now, I'm not saying you're perfect, but I'm saying take responsibility in that direction. Do your work well. If you're in school, do it well. If you're building a business, do it well. Don't, don't make promises that you don't deliver on. Ah. 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 Build credibility. That we would say, no, we know what you do. We know how you do it. Nehemiah was building credibility and it came out as legacy. It's building credibility. You can build, you can build. How you build great things, build credibility, build a certain level of doing your work at a very professional level. Do things well, build work credibility, build work credibility. Every one more day, you're not perfect. But what can we take for granted about your work? Keep a good attitude, a high level of professionalism, thoroughness, dedication to your work. Credibility, friends, is layer upon layer. It's layer upon layer. But let me suggest a second thing that Himal was building that came out as a wall. Again, I think he was building work relationships. Because what we see in that moment is that as the king noticed that who Nehemiah works with, as he noticed that Nehemiah was sad, it's like he hits the king. The king is saying, what are we going to do about this? And then the king starts writing letters to help him to get access to do this. The king was standing for him. Why? Because there's relationship. This is, this is the way I would ask you, everybody. I would ask you, in the space of your work, are you helpable? Are you even helpable? Because what will get this world built? It's not just your skill and your gifting and your calling. Relationships will happen, no? Somebody will know somebody for you. Are you hearing me this morning? Are you helpable? The last time the king helped you, Neymar, did you even say thank you? Eh? And you think that, you know, Mr. Entitled, are you hearing me this morning? Is there work? Is there work? Are you helpable? Build. Now, I'm not saying you become BFF with everybody in your office, but I'm saying keep a good relational attitude. Be a proper human being. Be polite. Be warm. To smile is not manipulation. Do you get what I'm trying to say? It's just being a good human being. It's just keeping a good aura and a good air about yourself. Be polite. The person that is trying to recommend you, you pass them this morning and you didn't even greet. So there's even that sense of why should I? Just make yourself help him. Are you hearing me this morning? I, I hope you are hearing me this morning. Because every time you are submitting prayer report, I'm telling you how God works. So be a proper human being. That you are a Christian doesn't mean you are not a human being. Be a proper human being. A proper human being. There are things that just work as human beings. Be good, be nice, be polite. Do you get what I'm trying to say? Be appreciative. 
Be a proper human being. Be appreciative. You know. All right, all right. So, Inisha was building. I need to run. I was building work relationships and it helped, okay? Be helpable. And notice that when Elisha was transitioning away from the king, notice that he transitioned respectfully and properly. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Yes, he had something that God had put in his heart to do, but notice how he handled it. He handled it well. I'm out of here, man. Everybody to eh. Okay. All right, all right. Let me give you one more that he was building. Elisha was building work stamina. Ah, we need work stamina, don't we? If we're going to stay through, we need stamina, stamina, stamina. There's got to be, you know, like stamina. Have you seen before when footballers go to like the corner and, are, and one will stand? You can't get that, but you get like stamina. Eh? Go and work in the Do you need stamina? What did Elisha have? What did, what did Neymar have? Stamina. That we see him through all the opposition. Uh, Sambalat is saying what he's saying. Tobiah is saying what he's saying. He didn't have oh God, how can they say that about that, me? Stamina. If you're going to do great things, you need stamina. Help me look at somebody and say stamina. You need it though. They posted about me on social media. I can't even take it. Stamina. To build a great thing, you're going to need stamina. Stamina. Get some work stamina. Get some thick skin. You need it though. In this world, you will have tribulations. You will have. That's what Jesus prophesied. But you're going to be of good cheer because he has overcome the world. Amen. You need some stamina. I know, my mental health, my mental health, my mental I know. Mental health is important, I know. Hmm? I know, in fact, next month we're doing a series on mental health. We do it every year. It's very important. But listen to me well. Maybe there's an underlying bigger question sometimes when we shout all those things. Here's what I'll say to you. If I go to a place, I'm going to do work, and I'm looking for a validation of my identity in the place of my work, I will make myself vulnerable. Do you get what I'm trying to say? My identity is not my worth, my identity, all of that is not in the work. It's in who Jesus is to me. Are you hearing me? Your boss called you something. They say, oh, I can't really take it because you're not listening to what Jesus called you. He is not a prophet over your life. It's an opinion he's entitled to have. That's all. So my mental head, my mental head. You see, you see people doing well in their career. One fan somewhere, a footballer, one fan somewhere said, you're black. And I say, well, how can you say that? They threw banana at Daniel Alves. I will never forget. Racism, racism, racism. They threw banana at Daniel. He picked it up, he ate it, and he took the corner kick he wanted to take. Thanks for the banana. Are you, are you hearing me this morning? Now, listen to me. I am not saying places should be toxic. I'm not saying people should be abused. I'm not saying all of that. It's wrong, it's wrong, okay? It's wrong, yeah, get me well. It's wrong, it's wrong, don't, blah, blah, blah. But what I'm saying is at our own level, for what we want to do, for the sense of what God has called us to, we need stamina. We can't be distracted by all of this. We can't allow these things to overwhelm us. We need to build stamina if we're going to do great things. Have me look at somebody and say, get some thick skin, get some thick skin. Don't overly seek validation from your work performance. You know, your validation is in the cross of Jesus. Your worth is in who Jesus is to you. That's where your worth is. Settle that. You are loved. You are approved. You are chosen. I'm not just saying when it goes wrong, then you don't say, hey, my worth is in the cross. When it goes right, your wealth is in the cross. Are you hearing me this morning? Because people do well in exams. They say, I'm so good. I got 90, 90, 100. Then the day they fail, they don't say, oh my God, Jesus, you are my victim. Uh -uh. Now you know Jesus. When you are getting 90, you are so good. That's the point. When we win, our wealth is in Jesus. When we lose, our wealth is in Jesus. That's how we have a stability about our lives. And not volatile up and down. Are you hearing me this morning? All right, build some stamina and anchor your life on who Jesus is to us. But we need work stamina. We need work stamina. God loves you. And so if we have work stamina, we can stay through. We can build team spirit. We can build people. We can have inspiration. Listen to Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 18. And what he's saying to his men, it's a difficult time and all of that. But I told them of the hand of my God, which had been good upon me. And also of the king's word that he had spoken to me. So all the people that were even around me, and I will say, ah, let us rise up and build. The people that were around me were not caving into Sambalat and Tobiah. Because there was a sense of inspiration about me, stamina about me. So I was able to lift up and elevate the rope. Inspiration, let us arise and build. Then they set their hands to do this good work. All right, we're going to build hope. We're going to build inspiration. But the last thing that I would suggest to us this morning is that we're also going to build work plans. What we see with Neymar is that in building a great thing like the wall that is going to stand, he didn't just wake up one day 
and start you know stumbling around things the bible says that when he got to jerusalem if you if you read from Nehemiah chapter 2 he got there at night he went out he began to survey the extent of the damage what had been done what what is this going to take what do we need how are we strategizing through every season how are we balancing these things what do we need in construction what do we need in battling it's got to be strategy what will take us from point a to point b it's got to be a plan start out the year intentionally at different seasons of your work journey make sure there's like a routing i'm not saying all your plans will be perfect but i'm saying you have something to commit to the lord all right and then he would have stopped. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, all right? Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. But do you know what it says? It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, Proverbs 3, verse 5. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge. In other words, you should have your ways within which you acknowledge God. Are you hearing me this morning? And so in all those ways, I'm acknowledging God. I'm committing my plans to God, and he can start to establish my life. But there must be an intentionality. What are you trying to do? How are you trying to build it? And so as Nehemiah is building plans, it's coming out as a wall. He's building character. He's building credibility. He's building stamina. And it's coming out as a wall. As I close this morning, maybe you'd say to me, I hear all that you're saying, but it's difficult for me. It's hard. I don't even know where to start building from. I don't even have land. Where will I build? I don't even have a job. I don't know what to do. Where do I even start from tomorrow morning or this afternoon? I, I don't have what I want to have, where I want to be. Or I've tried to do some of these things. I tried to have stamina. I got knocked out. I tried to have credibility. I, I failed myself. Where do I start from? Maybe you look at all of this and say, man, that worked for Neymar. He built a great wall, but I don't have all of that. Hey, I forgot to remind you because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11, that there's no other foundation that anybody can lay other than that which is laid, which is Jesus. Maybe I would encourage you today that we can start from the foundation. If we lay Jesus as our foundation, then we can truly be building credibility and relationships and stamina and plan. If Jesus is our foundation, because let me suggest to you today, friends, your building at the end of the day will take the shape and the strength of your foundation. I'll say that one more time. At the end of the day, every building will take the shape and the strength of your foundation. If you lay a foundation for a skyscraper, you can build a skyscraper. You hear me this morning? Your building will take the shape and the strength of your foundation. So what we see is that if we have Jesus, as our foundation, then we can truly be building credibility. I'm not that good a person. I'm not that faithful a person, but Jesus can make me that kind of person. I'm not that wise a person, but Jesus can be teaching me the plans to make. I don't have that much encouragement and stamina in myself, but when Jesus is at my foundation, I can crash back to my foundation and start building it back up again. That Jesus is that foundation that nobody else can lay another foundation that will stand. Jesus can be at the foundation. So today, can I remind you that if we will build our work journey, if we will build our hair to there on the foundation of who Jesus is to us the sacrifice that he has paid for us to have life the goodness of our Savior the love that has been shown to us the approval of God towards you in Jesus if you will start from there and rock your life on that foundation friends you can truly build I believe you can build great things against all odds it doesn't matter the times that we live it doesn't matter the difficulty of the world around us we can build great things against all odds if Jesus is our foundation and at some point in our lives it's not going to be a conversation of them it's not going to be a conversation of the system and we we try to do all these things pointing to them we try to do work stamina but we're complaining about them but i'm saying you can do work stamina built on him i'm saying that you can do everything on him he is strong enough a foundation he's strong enough for you to build your life on Friends, we can do great things to the glory of God for the good of people. Wherever you're putting out effort, whatever your Monday morning looks like, you can do great things. God can be glorified in your life. He can move you from your here to your there. He can move you from survival to significance. He can move you from, from, from that place where dreams feel far away to a life where you are actually walking in the things you dreamed of. You're actually walking in that sense of purpose and that rhythm of purpose. And I'm not saying it's a perfect place, it's a moving target, but you kind of feel the rhythms of that. You feel like my decisions, are, I mean, that place where my effort really, you can't get that kind of life. And I would invite you today, if we start from the very foundation and we build it up, we can be building all of this, building our credibility, building our stamina, and see it coming out as a wall that will be tangible for many generations. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. I'd invite you to stand, everybody. I want to say a prayer over you this morning and over the work of your hands. I, I have a scripture that God laid on my heart this morning that I want to just pray over the people of our church today. I believe in the power of a blessing. First Chronicles chapter 4 and verse 10. The Bible is talking about a man called Jabez. And I guess you've come across his story before. And Jabez was in the middle of all this listing of names and people just doing their hair. Everybody, one more generation, one more generation. The Bible stops and talks about a man called Jabez. And it says, Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you will bless me indeed and enlarge my territory, that your hand will be with me and that you will keep me from evil, that I may not cause pain. So God granted him what he requested. And what we, what we see with Jabez praying, there are four things in, in what Jabez is praying that I want to pray over us this morning. First of all, he's praying that God will bless him. And I believe this is the work of our hands and what you do and where you are in this season of your life, where you're putting out effort, whether on a job, volunteering somewhere, raising a family, stay at home, building credibility, whatever you're doing in this season, doing school, I'm believing that God will bless you indeed. All right? And then he says that God will bless me. And the second thing is that there will be an enlargement of his territory. I believe that there are people here this morning that God just wants to move into a larger space in what you do. There's a sense of our found rhythms and building things, but I can really do with a larger space. I can really do with more reach. I can really do with more influence. I can really do with God giving, putting his hand upon me for more. I, there's more gifting, more that is burning in my heart. And I know this is what I have in my hands, but there's more in my heart. And it says that God would enlarge my territory. And the third thing he's praying is that God's hand will be upon him. And that's the presence of God. That there'll be that sense of God is with me. I don't want to be thrown into deep waters where the presence of God is not with me. Like Moses prayed, he said, God, if your presence will not go with us, don't lead us there. Don't, don't prosper me to a place where you won't be with me. The real mark of prosperity is the presence of God with us. And then he says that, God, you will keep me from evil. That you will keep me from evil. Yeah, we do live in that kind of world. That we do live in a corrupted world work will throw you into a lot of shenanigans. People will do what people do. It's not always as cute as what the church environment looks like. But can we believe that there will be the protection of God upon our lives every single direction we turn? The doing business in deep waters, God will protect you. You are doing life at a higher level than you've ever done. That God will protect you. And it's those four blessings I want to speak over you today. The blessing of the prosperity of God, of the enlargement of God, of that sense of influence, the blessing of the presence of God, and the blessing of the protection of God. Will you hold out your hands where you are, everybody online? Hold out your hands in this moment. God, in Jesus' name, I pray over your people today. Every single person hearing my voice today, I pray that blessing, God, of your prosperity, for the glory of God, Lord. Prosper your people. Put your blessing upon what they do. Put a fresh idea. Let there be a fresh wave. Let the Holy Spirit just brighten up things in their lives, God. Prosper. Prosper your people. Like Jabez prayed and he said, God answered. I prayed over you today that indeed God will bless you. You will look at where your life gets to and all you will be able to say is that God bless me. I know I went to school. I know I did that. I know I called that person. I know I tried that. I built that plan. But let's be honest. This is the blessing of God. This is the blessing of God. The kind of fruit I'm seeing over my children in my home. This is indeed the blessing of God. And I pray in Jesus' name for an enlarged territory. God, I pray for influence this morning. I pray in the name of Jesus that you just put a weight of influence upon people. I pray for people reaching. I just pray you would reach across the lines this morning. Your influence will reach across the lines. It will reach across territories. It will reach across nations. In the name of Jesus, I pray a blessing of more influence upon your life. That God will enlarge your territory. Where you have been a local champion today, I pray God will make you a global champion where you have excelled in a space and in a sphere. Today I pray for you that God will take you over and above your wildest dreams in the name of Jesus. You'll get a call from somewhere. You'll get an invitation from somewhere. God will give you influence for the glory of his name. And I pray for you today for the presence of God to mark your journey. The presence of God. And when you go to the left, to the right, you'll hear that voice. Your life will not be a stranger to the voice of God. His presence will be with you. His presence will walk with you. Even when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you will know that He is with you. I pray that your prosperity will never take you out of the presence. Your prosperity will never keep your heart away 
from the presence. You will be deeper and deeper a lover of the presence of God. You'll be more and more at home with the presence of God. And today I pray for the protection of heaven to be upon you. That where work takes you, where business takes you, school, whatever, endeavors, just that adventure of doing life. Today I pray that you are the kept of the Lord. You are protected, you are preserved. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand by your right hand, but only with your eyes would you behold the reward of the wicked. It will not come near you. For in vain, the, the, the goldsmith, they might fashion weapons, but, but no weapon fashioned against you will prosper. God will keep you. God will preserve you. Some of you are going to swim in deep waters for the assignment of God, but listen, you are safe with the presence of God. You are safe with the presence of God. You're not going to live small. Life is going to be this big adventure for you, but you would enjoy the protection of God. You will know what to do. You will know how to do it. You will know where to turn. You will know where not to go. You will know who not to go with. I pray protect the business people here this morning and there are deals that can wreck your life. Today I pray, just before the deal, it will be canceled. In the name of Jesus. God will keep you from error. God will keep you from error. In the name of Jesus. For the glory of God, for the good of his people, you will prosper and the work of your hands Jesus will be glorified you are his workmanship created to do good works friends you will do good works you will love doing good work you will love your work your work will be fun you can wait up you can wait to wake up every day to get back to the adventure of destiny and of purpose in the rhythms of work you will love it you will know what it means to be a blessed person doing work to the glory of God I pray in the name of Jesus the Christ everybody said amen While we stay standing this morning, I want to make an invitation for somebody who doesn't know Jesus. I don't know who you are, how you got to be in church this morning. It's such a joy that you're with us. We are so glad and grateful that you'll be here. But then check out what I said right here. There's nothing else we can build if we don't have our foundations right. At the start of all of this is who Jesus is to us. And we believe that once and for all, there's a Savior that went up a cross. He died a death he did not deserve to die. That we can have a life we don't deserve to have. Anybody you see here is in the right standing with God. It's not because we're good enough for that, but it's because Jesus' sacrifice is good enough for us. And today, that's my invitation for you. Would you say yes to Jesus? Maybe you've played God games. Maybe you're running around, hiding in the shadows. He sees you. <laughs> you can't hide from God. He sees you. That's why you're hearing this today. He knows your worst, but today he's inviting you to your best. And I want you to take that chance. I don't know who you are, but Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Oh no, but I've failed and I've failed and I've failed and I've let God down. You are never the one holding him up. He loves you. He knows you. He knows your words. He knows your story. And Jesus' story is more than enough for your story. Would you say yes to him today? Maybe at some point in your life you had made a decision for him, but as we speak, you know you've walked away and you want to be made right with God. Or maybe you've never done that. You don't have any God frame of reference. Today I'm inviting you to a savior that loves you, that made you. One day would stand as your judge, but before that offers himself as your savior. With every head bowed, every eye closed, I'm asking people today who would say, you're speaking to me, I need Jesus. I need forgiveness, I've sinned, I've fallen short. I need the grace of Jesus. I need a new life. I need a new beginning. I need salvation. On the count of three, right where you are, I want you to put your hand on your chest with all boldness, every eye closed, every head bowed, nobody looking around and online, wherever you are this morning. It's your chance, it's your moment. Would you say yes to Jesus? On the count of three, put your hand on your chest. If you say you're speaking to me, I'll be so glad to lead you in a prayer. One, two, three. Put your hand on your chest right where you are. He sees you. He knows you. God bless you. God bless you. That is a miracle happening in your life. God bless you. Anybody else want to join in? Please do that before we pray. God bless you. That's a miracle happening in your life. Nobody, nobody takes a step towards God in Jesus and it's wrong. It's the right thing. God bless you. God bless you. You know what? This is the family of the crowd. I'm going to have all of us say prayer together. Everybody who has their hand on their chest, say these words with boldness, knowing that God hears your voice this morning. Can we all say together today, Heavenly Father, I come to you today because you've made a way for me to come. Through the death, the burial, and the resurrection of your son, Jesus. See, I believe with all my heart that Jesus Christ is the son of God and is the savior of the world. I make today the day that I boldly confess Jesus Christ as my savior and my Lord. Please forgive me of the past. 
Give me a whole new start. Please wash me clean of all my sin. Say, I boldly confess that Jesus is enough for me. You are my Savior and you are my Lord. I give everything to follow you. Fill me with your grace. Fill me with your spirit. And I'll never be the same. And I'll say one day, I'll be with you in heaven. I believe it. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Can we congratulate everybody? We pray that prayer. Man, we're so proud of you. That's a miracle that just happened in your life and we are so proud of you. You know what? It's a family of the crowd. We would love to serve you in every way that we can. And so if you prayed that prayer this morning, right after the service, once you get out of the doors, you're going to see our team around the premises waving this. It's a gift that we want to place in your hands from our church. There's something to get you started. So all you need to do is tell any of them I prayed that prayer. They would love to give this to you. It's free of charge from our church. And they would also love to record your decision so that we can be praying for you and serve you in any other way that we can. So whether it's a first time decision or you're recommitting to that decision, please let us know so that we can be praying for you and serving you in every way that we can. If you are online, that's how you can let us know that you prayed that prayer. But one more time, let's say congratulations to everybody who prayed that prayer. That's a miracle, isn't it? Are you not glad and grateful for every single person? Amen.